Hello, everyone. It's so great to be here. I'm very excited about this webinar. We probably could have added my piece to the panel, which is um, writing, because I do a lot of coaching through writing as well. So maybe we'll integrate a little bit of that into the conversation as well. Um, but I'm very excited about our panel. And I first want to give each of them an opportunity to briefly introduce themselves before we dive into the questions and the conversation. So um, I also want to add that we're going to probably spend around the first 50 minutes or so um, ask, you know, um, discussing a set of questions that I have for them. And then after that, in the final, um, you know, 25, 30 minutes, um, we'll open the floor to questions. And so think about those questions. Um, make sure, um, as Sue said, to put your questions in the question and answer box, and um, we'll definitely uh, engage you at that time. So um, first, as, I, as you were told, I am the Director of Education for the Institute of Coaching. And um, these are one of the wonderful things that I get to do as Director of Education. I'm also a certified coach. Um, and I, I do engage in um, coaching around writing, and I also integrate the skill of writing into the coaching work that I do, um, whether you're a writer or not. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Ursula Castellano so that she can introduce herself. Sure. Thank you so much, Pamela. It's a joy to be on the panel this morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Yes. Uh, I am a, I'm a sociologist, an ethnographer, and a coach. And as a sociologist, I've been focused on research that looks at criminal justice reform and alternatives to incarceration. And I've become particularly interested in the intersection between uh, the criminal justice system and, and the mental health system. So photography for me, and that's my creative outlet, um, I, I really started using photography as a conversational tool when I did a, a a research project with justice involved veterans. And this was, uh, I had an opportunity to work with the Veterans Treatment Court, which for those of you that don't know, it's a, a type of problem solving court that offers treatment in lieu of incarceration for veterans who have been charged with felony or misdemeanor offenses. And previously, I'd really I'd focused primarily on decision making practices of, of court professionals. And these are treatment teams that are typically staffed by legal and mental health uh, professionals. But I became very curious about how participants were experiencing these courts. Mm -hmm. And um, it was really important to me that veterans have a lot of autonomy over what stories they shared and how they shared their stories. And so I knew that more traditional interviews wasn't going to be appropriate in this context, but cameras and visual images, photography specifically, seemed like a way to give veterans a voice in how they shared um, their stories. And so I developed a technique specific to, to that project. But over time, as I moved into coaching a few years ago, I adapted it for more um, for virtual coaching coaching context, which I look forward to sharing more about how I do that. I love it. I love it. And so there's a, there's a research um, method that's called photo voice. Is this the same method or is it sort of a related method? Photo voice is related. Okay. The method I use with veterans treatment court participants is called fo a photo elicitation interviewing. Okay. And that's a specific way of gathering data. Photo voice is used for organizational or community um, types of situations where uh, individuals want to bring about a kind of social change. Got it. So that's, that's what voter voice is used for. So, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So now we're going to move on to Benjamin Voyes. And uh, Benjamin, would you mind sharing who you are and um, about your craft? Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, originally and still a uh, first and foremost a musician, an orchestral conductor, but I uh, have also led several cultural and academic institutions. I'm now Professor Emeritus at Boston University, and I used to be the Dean of the College of, uh, of Fine Arts. But I still work uh, as, uh, as a coach with uh, senior uh, people in the arts, uh, teaching leadership uh, in several universities, both uh, in the States and abroad. And particularly, I just spent uh, my summers working with uh, incredibly talented kids. Uh, I spent the last six weeks 
uh, at Interlochen in Michigan, uh, conducting uh, a symphonic orchestra. And it's wonderful to see uh, all the uh, energy and, and how to put that, uh, that talent to, together uh, in a sense of common purpose and uh, through the exploration of wisdom in, 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 uh, in finding the best uh, intonation, the best truth, the best possibility for growth. And um, well, I sometimes have dealt particularly this past summer with many uh, both senior artists and, and young artists who, who, who have had a difficult time during COVID and have been uh, mm -hmm. blocked in their creative processes, depressed, who have lost the ability of even playing together or who have been subject to, uh, to bullying because of the, um, the lack of um, a social maturity that uh, was not allowed to, to flourish, particularly in young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my goal as a, a parent uh, very kindly said to me is just to, to provide a safe place for kids to, to be vulnerable and to grow as people, not only as musicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, that requires, of course, uh, lots of, uh, of teamwork, uh, of emotional intelligence, and also of, uh, of letting uh, yourself go. I was very surprised that many of these young artists are also incredible at uh, math or uh, astronomy or sports and that uh, they may end up being uh, uh, lawyers or medical doctors or uh, great musicians, of course, but that they have a, um, a need of finding uh, a center of, uh, of sharing their love for, for the arts, for one another and self-realization. So that's where I have found that using uh, positive psychology and uh, all the tools uh, developed by uh, Maslow and Eric Fromm uh, can give us a, a good sense for these kids to really uh, mend the world that we have put on fire. And also uh, when they okay. perform classical music know that they the, the music that we think is beautiful and perfect and immaculate of Mozart or Beethoven or Schubert mm -hmm. was written in times of conflict and war and, uh, and great struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these same tools when applied to adults or to people in, in other industries, I see that can be very, uh, very effective. Uh, there was a bullying incident uh, recently, and the father of one of the uh, of the uh, kids involved uh, is also a teacher of leadership and a coach whose background is in the military, a very distinguished career in the military. And uh, well, uh, what I used was ask them to come with a, a way that could be a solution that would be agreeable to, to both. I asked them to shake hands to have a, a dialogue. And I told them, I may or may not accept your, um, your proposal because like in, in academia or in the military, in music, we have a very ver vertical structure, but they came up with something that was agreeable to both. I modified it a little bit. I asked them to shake hands. And the premise that was that they were going to use this as a growth experience. So I think that uh, this is really uh, a good uh, use of all the, the coaching skills. And unlike the conductors of the uh, uh, mid 20th century or before that were just shouting and telling because I say so, well, yeah. let's ask, ask young musicians to, to stop and enjoy. I mean, because you did it so well, not <laughs> only look at the, at the problems that need to be solved, but at all the beautiful things that happen together. I love it. I love it. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, and one of the things that uh, I, I just wanted to acknowledge a comment 
from Anel Nguyen and says that, uh, hello, I'm from Hamburg, Germany. I'm a coach who has a degree in sports and performance science. Um, so I'm super excited about this webinar. So I'm loving, yeah, please in the comments, share with us your interest in the arts uh, so that we can know who's in the room as well. I love it. Um, and so last but not least, um, uh, Desiree Cocroft, who is uh, here to represent the, um, the, the art of movement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. And I have to say where I'm from because I'm seeing where everybody is saying where they're from in the chat. I am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am in Delaware for work today, but I live right outside of Bowie, Maryland. So I just wanted to say that uh, shouting out to all those different states. Um, so my name is Desiree Cocroft. Uh, I love to ignite and empower people to live their fullest potential. And I've been doing that through a lot of modalities over the years. I currently am a, a full-time coach and consultant for Franklin Covey, uh, where I am trained and certified in seven habits of highly effective people, um, as well as trust and all of the other uh, great uh, content that that company creates for us to go and coach other leaders in. Uh, I also have my own private practice where I specifically coach uh, entrepreneurs and leaders that have small businesses and really helping them to not just get clear about their own personal passion and mission, but also helping them make room in their life for the things that they truly desire aligned with those missions. Um, and some of that is creating their own businesses or creating passion projects. And some of them is just wanting to make more time for the things that they enjoy um, in life that isn't necessarily based on making, you know, more money or something monetarily. Um, and so a lot of my training um, has come from positive psychology as well, uh, like Benjamin, uh, positive intelligence, uh, strength finders, um, all the different things uh, that uh, we could possibly be uh, trained on. I feel like I've dibbled and dabbled in a little bit of all of it. Um, I'm a PCC uh, ICF coach, and I also have my own dance company. So that's where that movement creativity comes in. So about 18 years ago, myself and two friends started a nonprofit dance company in my hometown of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, and so I've had that company, Signature Dance Company, shameless plug, <laughs> since, mm -hmm. since then. Uh, the thought, though, was... Oh, Myself and my friends were adults, uh, early 20s. Uh, we hadn't been formally trained in dance, uh, but we wanted to have a space in dance uh, where we could not only, you know, perfect ourselves in dance, but also uh, do a lot of personal growth, both mentally, spiritually, um, and personally, um, and really creating this space of sisterhood because a lot of us had did a lot of women and girl programming. So that's where our focus became. And so with that being said, uh, it became not just a place of dance, but a, a, a place of personal growth. Um, and so over the years, being able to mentor uh, not just, you know, children, but also adult uh, women and men over time, uh, being able to use movement as the key. So in my private practice, I love to use uh, movement and dance illustrations. Uh, my, my hashtag goal is uh, to actually have movement and dance as a part of the training that I do actually. Right now I use a lot of illustrations uh, from that dance world in the things that I coach. Um, I started doing that about two years ago when I uh, created my first, not created, but when I did, uh, really just seeing so many different parallels between dance. Um, and I love, especially having doing granular state dance movement can really help anchor you in the things that you desire to do um, in a real cellular way. Um, and so I really love to be able to use that. And it's fun. Uh, there's so many reasons why movement and dance can really be helpful in the coaching world, uh, whether it's illustrated or done physically. But obviously, I feel like there are so many more benefits of doing it physically uh, while also coaching, just like any other thing in terms of movement, athletics and all of that. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing now. And I really have a heart for adults that have never moved in a dance like way. Um, I uh, started off as a dancer as a kid. I did African dance. I did hip hop. I did dance team, but I didn't have formal consistent training until I was about 28. I know I look 28, uh, but <laughs> I was about 20 full time for dance at University of Wisconsin. I'm walking after coming back from Hampton University. And so that's where my formal training happened. So I have such a heart for people that want to jump into something formalized after, you know, spending your adult years not doing it. And it just, it, it teaches you so much waiting later in years. And later, 28 is not, you know, old. In terms of dance, people started like two, three, four, five years old. And so uh, it was like a great way to overcome so many um, mind shifts that I had or um, limiting beliefs that I had about myself being 10 years older than most of the people that were in my classes. So um, again, uh, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And yeah, that does. I mean, there's, there's levels, there's themes of bravery that comes through your story in terms of we're going to start a dance company, no formal training, but let's do it. 
and and now helping people who are adults step into something they haven't stepped into it before. So that that alone is powerful for for um, for coaching. Yes, Benjamin. Well, I, Pamela, I would like to ask you about your experience with writing because oh. you you're not only the moderator, but you're a great artist yourself. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, Benjamin. Um, so I will say that I am um, the founder and owner also of the Academy of Creative Coaching. Um, so creativity has always been a big thing for me as well. And so um, my creativity primarily comes through the writing. Um, and so right now I have a couple of coaching clients who are writing their dissertations, who are interested in writing books. But also, um, one of the things that I do for um, you know people who are looking to um, uh, you know acquire certain goals in their careers, and it's not related to writing specifically, um, is I have them think about the story that really grounded them in where they want to go. So, for example, I had a client who wanted to start a company. And it was focused, and, and I can't even say the name of the company because the, the company, uh, I'm, the, I can't tell the story because the story is the name of the company, which is awesome because um, she didn't have a name for her company. But I asked her, what is the story that really grounds you in why you want to create this company? And she told the story, and I'll just kind of be general, but of being a little girl and aspiring to something. And there was something symbolic in her neighborhood that drove her and that was really sort of iconic for leadership for her. And so that 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 thing that was in her neighborhood that she walked out of her house and looked at every single day became representative of this is what it means to make it. This is what it means to be successful. And so that story of that little girl um, became that, that iconic thing she used to look at every time she walked out of the door became her the name of her company um, because she realized that's the thing. And so even if it's not specifically the writing piece, it's the storytelling piece. And, and how do you use those stories to drive where it is that you wanna go? And so I engage in a lot of storytelling, the narrative um, coaching and, and those things to help people articulate um, you know, who they are um, through a series of stories. Um, the writing, of, of course, I always integrate, you know, of course, where it fits for people, the journal writing, um, sketching out models that are visual so that they can envision where they want to go. And so pen to paper writing for me, um, as opposed to typing, is much more effective in getting those creative juices going. And so I try to encourage people, pen to paper writing, pen to paper writing, um, drawing. If you're not a writer, how do you draw it out? How do you map it out? Um, and so, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of the work that I, that I do. Um, I integrate it in everything I do. And then when I'm specifically helping people with their writing, um, one technique is I'll have them speak it out, talk about it, talk through it, record yourself, hear yourself. Um, and if, if you're, if the writing part is a challenge, talk about it first, you know, so Thank you for that question. <laughs> so I'm going to dive into, um, I really want to know, and, and this can be brief um, because I, I really just want to give people a snapshot of who you're working with. And I know you've given us a little bit of that. Um, you know, Ursula talked about um, the, the populations that she's working with and so forth. But I'm curious to know what audiences tend to gravitate to the type of coaching that you do and for whom has, has it been most beneficial in your experience? And if you feel like you've already sort of given this, um, you don't have to go through it again, but if there's something else that comes to mind, um, please do feel free to share. And this is for anybody who wants to jump in first. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to jump in first quickly. Uh, so certainly you know, with photo methods, traditionally ethnographers have, worked with what what is termed vulnerable populations mm -hmm. so children formerly incarcerated persons persons with chronic illnesses persons who are homeless and and so i mean from that vantage point i mean i've worked with veterans who are in the justice system but from that vantage point you know working with with photographs is uh would be uh, well received with health and wellness coaching uh career coaching life coaching grief coaching but um, the point I'd, I'd like to make, though, is that photographs can be integrated into any coaching context with any population. It's not about the niche. It's about the client. Mm 
Hmm. Um, you know, so for example, you could use photographs with relationship coaching, you know, where each member of the relationship, each person in the relationship could take photos and then bring their, their images um, to the coaching session. Um, you could use this with team coaching, you know, organizational coaching. And mm -hmm. we talked about photo voice earlier, and that's a great template for it for to adapt for team coaching um, context. Um, but there, there are a number of benefits for working with photographs. And I'll, at some point, I'll say specifically about how I use it. But you know, the benefits are no matter who you're working with, as in my experience, the the photographs reveal things that are often hidden. Right. Mm -hmm. And often hidden in plain sight. <laughs> I mean, they're like physically on the table and you just never saw it. Uh, but they also reveal things that are hidden that are have never been seen. Right? Right. Um, mm -hmm. They're also the photographs are also really powerful for seeing relationships between people and objects mm -hmm. and seeing relationships between people through objects. Uh, I found that to be really powerful. Yes. Uh, another benefit that that I've really come to appreciate is that the photograph becomes, if you're doing it in person or, or virtually, it becomes almost like a third party in the coaching session, which means that it accommodates silence. It allows people to pause, to reflect in a way that's oftentimes for many of us is a little bit uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. So those, those are some of the some of the benefits and but the main point is that it can be incorporated into any any coaching relationship. I love this so much. And, and one of the things that um, I think corresponds one of the comments um, from Amy Logan is I'm a certified Jungian coach mm -hmm. who uses Jung's active imagination in my sessions. And so when you're talking about Ursula, the things that are hidden that you can see in photographs, Jung, Jung's work focuses, uh, does some shadow work as well. And let's look at some of the things that are hidden, mm -hmm. hidden in plain sight. Um, and not always the negative dark stuff that are hidden, but right. the things that are hidden that are, that could bring us joy that we don't even notice. Yes. Um, yeah. And just as a quick follow-up, I, I found that as well, that one of the benefits of working with veterans in photographs is, you know, many of them are at a place in their lives where they, it's, it's a difficult place in their life. Right. Right. They have a, shame, a lot of shame and guilt um, of being involved with the criminal justice system. They have other issues going on. But if they can see in the photographs that they they did do some things right, and I quote one of my participants, right? I, I have some successes in my life, and it's they can see it in the photograph. Yes. Um, and so that that was really important. For oh, so good. <laughs> so, so Desiree, I'm going to jump to you real quick about who, who comes to you, or is it just dancers? Who are the people that that tend to come to you? Who's your audience? Yeah, I was thinking about that because I feel like I get a lot of just creatives. <laughs> I get a lot of creatives in general, so they might uh, be in the dance world. But I actually I get a lot of people that are from nonprofit, <laughs> uh, a lot of people that are educators. Um, I have a few people that are, are corporate individuals as well. So it's a myriad. But I think even though that might be the industry that they're in, you know, I, I love I love coaching because people are people. And when you take their careers, when you take their titles away, they're people that want to grow. Um, and most people come to me because they want to grow and they want to do something that's outside of what their career box has put them in. Right. And so I feel like giving them that illustration of dance or um, encouraging them to move in different ways, um, I think helps them kind of get outside of their box and really being able to see the correlation of how movement can help them be better in their everyday lives and even in their career is helpful. So that, that's what's interesting um, is that people are drawn to dance even if they're not dancers because mm. I feel like I, I kind of set that bar of being someone that started later in life, um, at least from a trained perspective, but anybody can move. Um, and I think moving to music just makes it more fun. Uh, yeah. And so I think that some people, especially now, uh, you know, post pandemic air quotes, uh, people want more fun. <laughs> people want more joy. People want to move their bodies because like now, you know, we're in front of a computer. People are sitting so much now. Yeah. Uh, so I think so many people are attracted to do it. So the, the inclusive, inclusive part of me has to say, 
to, um, to your point about if anybody can move. I also want to acknowledge people move in different ways, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and so even those who may be experiencing paralysis or struggles with movement, um, there may be opportunities to consider movement with eyes or con- movement mm-hmm. in just in unique ways that, that we need to, that, you know, that enable us to experience movement. Yeah, so, absolutely. I did some work uh, a while back with uh, an elderly or senior citizen homes um, in senior homes where we did chair movement. Like everybody, they couldn't get up, but we did chair movement. We laid it to music. It was a lot of fun, but it just, yeah. it continued to anchor that, you know, everybody can find a way to enjoy music and movement. Thank you for that. Um, and I also want to acknowledge, I see that Janet um, Bo- Boguk, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. My apologies if I got it wrong. You have a question in the box. Just encouraging you to put it in the Q&A box so that doesn't get lost in the chat um, because at the end, we're going to go through the Q&A and look at all, their, all the questions. So we don't want to lose your question, Janet. Um, okay, Benjamin, who is your audience? Well, it's again, very, very varied. I, I work, uh, as I said, with uh, many minority leaders who um, have to deal with uh, different levels of um, uh, aggression and racism. And uh, sometimes that starts within their family and even within them themselves. They think that trying to hide their, uh, their African ancestry or their Mexican ancestry will help them in their career. Mm-hmm. And through this conversation in, in, in coaching through, through music and the arts, when they embrace their identity, they, they are not afraid of who they are. Again, uh, there's a little bit of Jung there, but uh, in a positive sense, they, they feel empowered and they become better leaders. And uh, again, it can be children, it can be uh, conductors or composers, writers, and I even had the opportunity of being uh, a cultural consultant for uh, Pixar, uh, for a, a film that maybe some of you uh, heard about that is called Coco. And there we talked a lot about uh, colorism, about ageism, about mm-hmm. uh, Alzheimer and the, and the role of music to remember. And, and part of, what, of, what, that, uh, of the exercises that I do is to underline that not only playing or composing music is a creative process, but listening to music is a creative process. Mm-hmm. As performers, we are not trying, we are not mediums, we are not trying to bring the, the emotions of Beethoven or Mozart, but to put our emotions, our troubles into the landscape of the music of Schubert or Beethoven or Mozart, because they also dealt with frustration, with uh, death, with pain, with Mm -hmm. illness and with war. Yeah, wow, oh, so powerful, thank you. Um, So yeah, so there's a broad range of people, which essentially the answer is everyone. (laughs) Between all of us here, (laughs) yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I do want to say that, um, and, and just to just put it out there, I see that Jordan Myers asked about, um, you know, where do we learn about narrative coaching? Um, and, and David Drake is the, the narrative coaching guru. Um, and so we'll just make sure we put some links or include some links in the follow-up email to point you into that direction. Um, so next, um, How can coaching, so this is one of the reasons why this topic is so important to me. Um, One of the reasons why um, the Academy of Creative Coaching has um, people from a wide range of of, of, um, backgrounds that come for training from being a dancer to being a medical professional, because the concept I have around creativity is not necessarily the the art in and of itself, but it's also a mindset in terms of a strategy. How do you creatively implement change? How do you creatively problem solve? And and sometimes when we do learn creativity in the art form, it allows us to transfer that over. Um, So my question is, how can coaching clients 
in traditionally non-performative fields like medicine, finance, law enforcement, and maybe there is some performance involved in these fields, arguably, um, but how can um, coaching clients from these non-performative fields benefit from a creative coaching experience? Uh, I'm happy to go first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, so um, it actually, the, just the mention of, of narrative coaching is, is um, interesting to me because uh, while I, when I started my photography project with veterans, I initially asked them to photograph their everyday experiences with the court program. Mm -hmm. um, but what was so fascinating is how they ended up using the camera, which went well beyond that initial prompt. So that they used the camera to talk about their life experiences before they went to the military during as well as as well as after yeah. um which is you know giving sort of a, a gave veterans court treatment teams mm -hmm. um a lot of really important insight into how to better serve the diverse needs of participants mm -hmm. so in my case i i shared of course anonymously with treatment team members findings uh, from veterans photographs and there were a couple of really important findings that led to programmatic shifts in the way they interacted with, with, with participants. So, for example, one of the important findings was that some of the Veterans Court's uh, program requirements ended up having a negative unintended consequence on participants. Hmm. I'll give you a, a brief example. I was working with John, who was a participant in the Veterans Treatment Court. And he took a photograph of a, a medical clinic and he said, you know, that this is where I have to go for my mandatory drug testing. And he went on to say, you know, the judge has his own system for drug testing us and he calls it the lottery. Now, that was in that conversation. The first time I learned that John was had been drafted into the Vietnam War. And he said, you know, I was number 35. I was one of the first to be called up in my neighborhood. I had no choice, go to war or go to jail. At least are his exact words, because I'll never forget it. Um, and so the, the judge's lottery system for drug testing participants, so, you know, resonated um, and dredged up these feelings of fear and uncertainty that he experienced with um, with, with his draft experiences. And that was quite impactful wow, for the treatment team wow. to learn. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the beauties of, of creativity is that it, it does elicit emotion um, and, and emotions that maybe we've never thought about or that we've actively tried to suppress. Um, and so, yeah, there's absolute power in that. Making those connections too. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, one thing I was thinking about is that it can be beneficial to people that are in industries where things are typically either A or B, <laughs> like it's either right or wrong. I right. feel like uh, things in the performing arts um, can give you just more possibilities. Um, I, I think of it as, you know, helping some of my clients think about their life as a choreographer, like you get to choreograph your life. Like what if that was possible? Um, because sometimes we admire the creative arts and what is the final piece in front of us. Um, and almost as if like, wow, how amazing is it that that person created such a something I can't even possibly fathom, but what mm -hmm. if we could possibly fathom what our lives could be created like? Mm -hmm. um, what if we really believed we were the creator of our, uh, creator, creator of our lives, the, um, the man behind the music in our lives or the woman behind the music in our lives or the choreographer of our lives, what would that look like? Um, and so I, I work with them, uh, a lot of my clients around having that childlike wonder, right? When you mm -hmm. were a kid um, at your most purest state before you know whatever happened, happened, you probably didn't care about moving around, like what toddler cares about asking questions and um, saying what's possible. And so how could we move in that way, like literally move in our lives. Um, and I feel like dance can give you that um, that correlation of moving, uh, like as I move, how else can my life move? But yeah. even just any any of the arts could really help us think about, you know, what would it be like if I could ask for create, paint the picture of my life? What would that look like? without caring about what other people think. And I feel like in those other, and especially when you have really um, just high stress positions, I feel like any position can really be high stress given circumstances, but just some of the ones that you mentioned that may not always lean from that creative side, um, so to speak, I think the benefit of just being able to kind of let go of some of the 
uh, constraints that some positions bring. I, I feel like that can be beneficial. And I feel like so many of those people, even if they're not in those specific industries, specifically leaders, because I, I coach leaders every day and just having to be buttoned up, having to be the person that um, is responsible for other people, just having so many things on their shoulder. I think the creative just gives them an outlet to be a regular person, mm. just to be regular again. Like I am a real person, you know, even though I lead this Fortune 500 department at my company, I'm a regular person that wants to paint or yeah. wants to go out dancing, that wants to move, that wants to learn a new language, you know, just wants to do something. And it's not only the people around them who need to know that, they need to know that about yes. themselves. I am a human, I'm a regular person, and, and I need to find those outlets. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Benjamin. Did you have any thoughts? Yes, of course. I mean, I, I, everything you say resonates a lot with me, and I had the wonderful opportunity of also working uh, in a, an MEC program that Boston University established at the Massachusetts prison system, working with uh, um, uh, prisoners who uh, were musicians or who wanted to use music, not mm -hmm. as entertainment, but really as education. Because I think that um, creativity is a learning process and uh, it's a transformational learning process. Uh, we don't see many people building pyramids or constructing Gothic cathedrals anymore. But every uh, country, every, every city that can afford it in the world, even in times of, uh, of war and distress, has new theaters, new concert halls, mm -hmm. new art centers. Just uh, this past uh, weekend, a new fantastic uh, art center uh, was inaugurated in, in Taipei. And um, that's what we do. We now are building the temples for the not the creator but the the human beings as creators and uh, that's something that we have to celebrate and we celebrate within us so this economy of work and family is very incomplete because we also have uh, hobbies we also have creative impulses that we we tend to put aside because we don't think it's serious, because it, it's, it, we can measure some aspects of creativity, but not necessarily all of it. I mean, again, Pamela is the expert, but uh, we have to really enrich our lives by exploring different uh, artistic experiences, different kinds of music. And mm -hmm. once we are interested and we become uh, a fan, an expert, then we uh, we go and explore something else. I mean, I had a friend who was putting together a, um, a wonderful show of contemporary art in a major museum, and he know how to how to organize everything. I said, well, this is how we sit an orchestra. The strings are here, the percussion there, the brass there. So use the same the the uh, paradox of the orchestra as a place to present the warmth of the strings, the individuality of the woodwinds, the power of the brass. And again, in a narrative, when people are uh, asking me for help when doing a, a big presentation, I ask them to score yeah. it. I mean, what kind of uh, instrument would you like to be there? When do you have a, a, a place for, for speed, a place mm. for silence? Silence is very powerful. And then how you build up at the end with a big crescendo so that everybody pays attention. Yeah. And, uh, this is the second time silence has been mentioned in this <laughs> webinar. And, um, and, and I just noticed even in the silence, I filled it with a mm hmm. So I couldn't even manage it in that moment. <laughs> but there's power in silence. And I think um, the creativity can allow us to develop mindsets that welcome it because it really is the thing that um, helps us develop our creativity when we can sit in the silence and, and, and understand the power of that. So um, now I, you, you don't all have a situation that's perfectly fine, but um, I'd love to hear about a transformational experience or a technique. Ursula, a lot of people are asking, what's the technique for photography? What do you do? Do you have them take pictures? Do you take pictures? So, <laughs> so that's just a little um, um, spoiler alert that people are asking about this. But um, what transformational experience or technique um, have you utilized in your, um, you know, your creative coaching practices? Is there one that stands out to you that you'd like to share? 
Go ahead, Ursula. Yeah, sure. So I use a number of techniques when I when I coach with photographs, but I'll focus on on one right now, and then the process I'll describe the 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 general tech the general process of using photographs. So the the technique that I use that I think is probably the most powerful, and most important, is called making the familiar strange. And this is a concept that comes out of ethnography. Um, but in a coaching context, it, it, it's an invitation to the client to start questioning things in their lives that they take for granted. Wow. And, it, you know, and taking on a new perspective on um, whatever area of their life that they're looking to, you know, bring, bring change to. So there are a number of ways to do this. So when I first started my photography project with veterans, I used disposable cameras. Mm -hmm. And so veterans took the camera and they took their photographs. Now, of course, they couldn't see anything that they took a photograph of right. until the photographs were printed. And so when we met again, you know, for the second time, I had the photos developed and printed. And it was only at that point that they saw their photos for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so while they had many took photos of things that they had seen, a hundred times, a thousand times, seeing it in the photo was as if they saw it for the first time. Wow. And so it was as though there was, they'd gained some objectivity and it stepped outside of their experience. Um, I will also mention that I did not look at the photos either mm. um, and, until the participant did. And I do think that's important. I also gave participants a chance to remove any photos that they did not want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've adapted this for a virtual coaching context, the you know, environment which most of us coach in, I would I presume, and there's a couple ways to do it. One is you can ask the client to take a photo set of whatever issue, problem, area of, li area of life they want to change, and then send those photos to the coach by email or whatever means, but both the coach and the client agree not to look at the photos. Okay. Until the next coaching session, um, th for the reasons I, I, I spoke of earlier, I think it creates a um, a real sense of trust and intimacy within the coaching relationship, where both have agreed not to look at the photos. Um, another way to do it is the is the client can take photos of photos, like if they have a photo album, right, mm -hmm. and then use the same process, send those images to the client. Um, the benefit of that technique is the client has a tangible, physical, tactical relationship with the photo as they talk about it with the coach. And with veterans, certainly, that was really, really important um, because veterans were able to access uh, um, deeper feelings, more memories, because they could physically move the photographs around. Yes. Um, and so I think you mentioned earlier, uh, Pamela, this important connection between the, you know, the, the our minds and our hands, right? Yes. That's an important access point for thinking, create thinking creatively. So I have to say, what a concept to that you take a picture and you don't get to see it right away and you see it after it's developed like that is a it's something we don't even think about anymore because everything is so automatic everything's on the phones and i have to say um I, when i first I, I i actually did use a a modification of a photo voice methods in in which i did give my students i did it with college students a disposable camera mm -hmm. and that was so the first time i ever did it was with disposable cameras mm -hmm. and i but what you just brought to light is the value of that technique from the standpoint of I don't get to perfect the image and mm -hmm. doctor it up and place, you know, like I did before this webinar, let me make right. sure it's right. pretty, you know, yeah. I take a picture just of what's there. And then when I get them back and I see them later, I, I might see something entirely differently than what I saw with my, you know, actual human eye. That, yeah. I just had to really emphasize the power of that. <laughs> and because I think we, like you said, have taken sort of normal life for granted. And, and that is a piece of a life that I don't, I think we, many of us have forgotten about. Yeah, it's, it's probably my, the number one technique uh, in this method, I, I think. 
I'm going to adopt it. Thank you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, Desiree or Benjamin. <laughs> well, um, working with uh, with people in large uh, organizations and doing uh, coaches for directors of different sections, I I invite them to come to an orchestral rehearsal and sit with the principals of a different section. And uh, at one rehearsal, I will tell the orchestra, well, this is a wonderful day to make mistakes. Please make as many mistakes as you want and make them boldly. Don't be shy about making mistakes. Take risks, really go to the impossible and see what you can do and what you cannot do. And uh, sometimes the, uh, our guests will be, uh, even if they don't read music, uh, the musician will nod them so that they play a role and, and turn pages for them and being uh, really listening very closely to the horns or the violins and so on and, and find out that it's something that we think is so uh, standard as, a, as an orchestra, there are still competing priorities mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. different risks. So when, when a mistake happens in performance, I mean, you cannot stay there watching uh the accident like when you are driving and there's uh, uh something in the road and 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 everybody slows down because they want to see what happened i mean you have to to keep going otherwise you are going to produce another accident and mm -hmm. then to know how to to simultaneously look at your part and look at the score of all the orchestra have uh, a, a clear sense of your role when you have to be louder, when you have to wait, when you have to be ahead, and then apply that technique for their um, uh, for their organization. Because many times in larger organizations, people don't know what other people are doing, what they are struggling with. They only blame uh, marketing because they are not doing and, and production uh, is being blamed because they don't have enough pro, uh, uh, new products or the products are, are not competitive. And uh, this is a wonderful uh, exercise for them to see that you really have to, to look at both your role within an organization and what is going on in the, in the rest of these large uh, mm -hmm. complex uh, companies that work uh, if they are good as an orchestra, and if they don't, they will not survive. Yeah, oh, I know, but I just love that today is the day that you can go big, yeah. make mistakes, <laughs> blow that horn the way that you want to, and, and maybe it'll work and turn into something even more amazing. I love it, and, and, and you know, my apologies if I don't have the language right, I don't know if they blow horns or how it works, but yeah. that's... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Desiree, okay, so just to repeat the question for the audience, tell us about a transformational experience or technique that you've utilized in your creative coaching practices. Yeah, uh, so it's great when you're last because <laughs> I was like, what do you think? Because I've used some different things. So um, one is heavily on improvisation. So um, that means anybody can do it because it's improv, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, you could do this with movers or non-movers or people that are not trained in dancer as dancers. Um, I've used it a lot with trained dancers, but I've also used it with people that have a mix of um, abilities or training. Uh, so we call it pedestrian movement. So to do things normally how you would do it. So like brushing my teeth, that would be a pedestrian movement. Like anything that you would do in regular life, but that's movement, right? Um, and so basically um, the prompt was to think about something that you have overcome, like something you have overcome in your life and to move it out, uh, use a pedestrian new movement first uh, from before you overcame it to after you overcame. Oh. So whatever that looked like. And sometimes I would give them counts like, oh, you know, do eight counts of it or two sets of eight counts of it, trying to give them some parameters and how long it needs to be. So we would do that and it would be fun, especially in a very safe environment to guess what that person overcame. So we would do that with each other. This is obviously in a group coaching you know, perspective. Um, and then the second part is for them to uh, transform the pedestrian movement. So now that you brush your teeth, how could you transform that movement from just this to something else? But we can almost still see it, but mm -hmm. it's something else. And so they get to expand their movement however they desire in whatever uh, movement is most comfortable to them. 
Um, I also start all these sessions. Well, first of all, in this session in particular, it was a very safe environment. They had been with each other for a long time, so they knew each other. They only, I always give people choice. Uh, whatever you feel comfortable talking about, there is no, this is a no pressure judgment zone processing space, you know? So people show that then. But even as, uh, so that was a great uh, experience after, and sometimes we'll process together or we'll process in journaling if people don't want to share out loud. Um, how they anchored themselves, how did it make them feel to be on the other side of that? So it's a great um, conversation piece. It's also a really great way to start um, a session with people that already are um, in relationship with each other. If you have like a new session starting, it's a great way to kind of start a session and see where they might want to go. Um, one thing I haven't done yet, but uh, as you all were talking, I was like, oh, I might do this. See, creativity comes in this space. Yes. <laughs> I was like, I would love to... Um, have them think about something they have not overcome hmm. and dance out what overcoming would look like oh yes you know like what would overcoming look like almost like reframing whatever they may be anticipating as worst case scenario into what they would actually desire it to be yes. um that would be an interesting way to see um how it would work for people to just get it in their bodies it's almost like creating muscle memory in advance mm -hmm. so i'm gonna you know, work this thing through and, and yes. this is what it should feel like. Yes. Um, yeah. I love that. And when you were first talking about the improvisation, mm -hmm. um, I, I was thinking about a role play scenario that I created. And I'm glad you say group coaching, because this was yes. also a group coaching uh -huh. scenario, and it was around relationships and it was around how we address tension in relationships. And so I gave them a scenario in which they're at a party as a couple and they noticed that one of the, you know, that their spouse was a little friendly, you know, the whole time with this other person. You're like, what's up with that? And so I told them the scenario and I said, now you're on the car, in the car on the ride home go. <laughs> and so what does that conversation look like? Um, and then the opportunity for the rest of the group to engage in conversation around that. Um, what would you like it to look like? You know, here's mm -hmm. what's the reality of what it looks like. What would you like it to look like? Let's play this again, you know? And so group coaching can be really fun when it comes to mm -hmm. um, scenarios like that, because you get the feedback of the room and, and so forth. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, now, I want to dive into a lot of people think that, you know, who aren't, who don't believe that they're creative. Um, they don't really believe in the universal, universal nature of creativity. And so there are people who resist um, creative approaches in general. Like we need to stick to the agenda, all this extra fluff, you know, um, is unnecessary. So my question for you all is how universal is creativity and can everyone benefit? I think we've answered the second part. <laughs> can everyone benefit from coaching that integrates creativity? So my, my core question here is how universal is creativity? How can that be brought out in people if, if it is universal? And whoever wants to jump in, whoever feels inspired. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Sure. So, I mean, certainly for me, I, accro I approach coaching from a humanistic perspective as well. I'm um, a, a sort of person-centered approach um, to coaching, and so I believe every person is innately creative being. Um, but it, this this resistance to creativity is is interesting, isn't it? I mean, what is it that we are resisting exactly? <laughs> and so, I, I think that that's worth exploring. Um, you know, for some people, for many of us, I would say we've developed a self concept that I am creative or I'm not creative. For many people, it comes from, you know, some wounding early on in life or at some point in life. Um, some of it's cultural conditioning, right? we're conditioned out of being creative. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that's important. The second point is that I think we have to define creativity differently because oftentimes we define it in limited ways. Right. It's I'm a painter, I'm a sculptor, I'm a dancer, I'm a musician, but there are so many ways to be creative. And I think what we're learning on this panel is that creativity is about accessing all of our senses and using all of our senses. So one of my favorite quotes about creativity is it's expressing inner feelings by creating outer forms. 
And I give full credit to Nancy, uh, Natalie Rogers, who was the daughter of Carl Rogers, um, for those of you who are familiar with person-centered uh, therapy. Um, and so I think we need a broader definition of creativity because that definition applies to anything, all aspects of life. The second point that I'll make is, I think it's really important that the coach set an intention to foster creativity in their clients. Because once you set that intention, you're gonna start listening differently. You're gonna start listening for things and hearing things you didn't before. You know, things that your client aspires to or used to do, but no longer does, right? How might that activity be possibly integrated into the coaching um, experience? Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say is um, that while creative approaches, that we use that broad definition can be very stimulating for clients and exciting, they're also challenging. That goes back to that resistance point, right? right? Um, I think clients resist, certainly with veterans, I've, you know, I've learned that they know innately, uh, intuitively, that, that that's a little bit risky, right? That it's gonna take some courage to, um, to look at something differently. And I had to realize that what I was asking of veterans with, with uh, using disposable cameras was really hard. You know, and how would I feel if someone gave me a disposable camera and asked the same thing? So I think that's an important acknowledgement to make. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, that's so good. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, Michelle Porter's comment in, in the chat that says that imagining gardening as a creative outlet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just the reason why I thought that was so important is because, gar you know, creativity isn't just painting and dancing and and so i think it's also about kind of what you're saying ursula to help people define what creativity actually is and, and mm -hmm. what that involves yeah. go ahead desiree did i cut you off yeah no 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 it's okay that was good um i think to ursula's point i think noticing what that resistance is but i think some of that starts in the client intake process too like being clear about what your coaching does <laughs> and what yeah. is a part of your coach people are going to be drawn to you because of what you do um, and so I think just in the client intake and people being enrolled in whatever program or sessions that you do, being clear about what it is um, and what it is not. Um, I think that when people get there and there, there may still be some, uh, you know, some resistance. And I think, I'm all, I mean, we as coaches, we ask for permission. So, you know, we're asking for permission. And just even when you are, um, if any of you have uh, personal trainers or if you're going to work out, and things of that nature, they're always going to try to figure out, you know, well, what things aren't you able to do right now? What things are you comfortable with right now? This is the low intensity version. This is the high intensity version. So I do think about like education if we differentiate, you know, for our clients as well, for their comfort zone. I mean, we're meeting people where they are um, and we're not shaming people. So I think being okay with it's not about you because it's not supposed to be about us as coaches. Mm -hmm. It's really about is being client centric. So if we're thinking about them and it's not about, you know, our process, I think we'll be fine. I think sometimes, and I mean, we're all human beings. Sometimes it hurts the team. Like, oh, this is amazing. Why won't they, why don't they want to do this? It's like, it tells so many people, like we do this all the time. So I think getting over ourselves is half the battle. <laughs> I love mm -hmm. it. I love it. All right. I have one more final question here, and that would be what recommendations do you have for coaches who want to have a personal um, creative outlet, but they're not sure how to integrate that into their work as a coach? And we'll start with Benjamin. Okay. <laughs> I think I muted. Yeah, okay. Oh. Uh, well, I mean, everything you have said has uh, resonated a lot with me. And um, again, uh, we can see it with children, we can see it with doctors, we can see it with lawyers, we can see it with nurses who are, uh, in my opinion, the he unsung heroes of the healthcare system. Um, we need to allow everyone not just to do things, but to be with mm. what they, uh, they do. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody can be trained to uh, to high performance if we treat them like machines. But if we leave, give them really the opportunity of uh, applying their, their creativity, of challenging, of being loved, of uh, asking why, of trying different things, then uh, we are going to really have a much better 
world. And uh, um, there, there are not enough uh, therapists to do this. The immense responsibility of coaches around the world is that we have a tsunami of people that need this uh, quick, efficient, effective ways in which people can be the best, not only for their skills. Leadership is not about skills, but mm -hmm. about being human. And that means being loved. That means uh, identifying a, a sense of purpose, uh, a North Star, something larger than, than what we are. And uh, be it dance or music, poetry or, uh, uh, or neuroscience, it's about the contribution that, that we will be uh, making for the world that, that uh, we want our, our grandchildren to live in. And it's uh, not only about dealing with climate change and war and hunger and poverty, but about a world where we have a different sense of, of value of, uh, of being more human. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Ursula or Desiree, what recommendations do you have for coaches who want to integrate creativity into their work? Uh, sure, I have a couple of a couple of points. Um, just as with clients, all coaches are naturally born creative beings. So I, we don't want to leave ourselves out of this equation. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, one, one, one recommendation is to, to do a personal inventory. What is it that I enjoy? What is it that uh, I find fulfilling? Um, and how might that integrate that in part or in whole into my, into my coaching uh, profession? I loved photography and film well before I started my photography project, right? Mm -hmm. And the photography project turned into a film project. Um, there's another wonderful uh, coach that has created a walking and talking approach yes. to coaching. And perhaps you're familiar with her. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was born of her love of, you know, long distance hiking and love of nature. Um, the second thing is there is, in my view, a direct relationship between creative expression, again, using that broad definition and showing up authentically or, or authentic selves. Mm -hmm. So, I will tell you that for a long time, I never knew what that really meant to show up authentically. I knew it, I understood it intellectually, I understood it theoretically, but it didn't make sense until I understood what it meant to me. And so I think that coaches have to figure out what that means to them. Um, and so for me to be authentic means to tell myself the truth about who I am and, and how I want it to show up. Yeah. So um, I think that coaches have to, to do that work as well. If we're going to ask our clients to do work that's stimulating and challenging, then where is the coach on that journey? Mm. Um, and if you're more authentic, if you're telling yourself the truth, then you're going to be a better coach. Um, okay. And yeah, so I guess those are my, um, my, my main points. Oh, a couple of other ideas in terms of um, recommendations. Experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, not with your clients necessarily, but experiment with IOC, those fabulous discussion groups. There's a specific discussion group around creativity. Um, you know, IO, ICF and Reciprocoach are peer coaching communities where you can try out some of these techniques. Mm -hmm. Trial yeah. and error. <laughs> that's really good. That's really good. I did not know there was a creativity group um, for the IOC. So that's, that's there is. Oh, good to know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, it's already been some great things said. Um, I wanted to add to it is to uh, actually allow people to pay you for it. <laughs> so I know that might sound funny, but it is. I think sometimes uh, we get so caught up in wondering if what we want to do is creative enough or if it's good enough and seeing somebody resonates with it. I mean, if you've had any experience, I think it's kind of like what Ursula is saying, that trial and error. It's just like, I mean, if a client is interested and you have a process, instead of questioning whether it's creative enough, see if the process works, if a client is interested in doing it with you and not causing them to be guinea pigs. No, you truly have, like when I saw the comment about gardening, you obviously have been doing gardening. <laughs> like you didn't just learn it yesterday 
Uh, so you've obviously been doing it, whether you question, not this person, but whether you question whatever you're thinking is a natural gift or you've done inventory for yourself is worthy enough to be a coach or to coach people in. I think the fact that you're asking the question is that you should go ahead and do it. Mm -hmm. Like, just go do it and see how it goes uh, with a client, you know, but if you have already have that creative piece, I feel like if you're questioning it, it, it's almost an indicator that you should go do it. We spend mm -hmm. too much time trying to get validation from five different people about why we should do a thing where we should just go do the thing and then we'll get the validation uh, then or we'll have a new idea one or the yeah. other yeah it's learning it's all it's all learning yes yeah i love that so we're going to move into the q a segment of of this conversation um we have about 20 a little over 20 minutes um to go and um i'm going to answer the questions that are in the q a if you put your question in the chat it's lost so make sure you put it in the Q&A um, so that I can make sure we capture it. Um, so the first one is from Leanna D'Angelo. And she says, this is directly to Ursula. And this is related to the question I told you everybody's asking. But if there's anything you want to add to this um, from based on what you've said earlier, that'd be great. Uh, but Ursula, explain more about the photographs you're, take, you're talking about. Where do they come from? And how do you introduce this to clients? And then I'll ask the next one because it's related. Um, Janet is asking, I may have missed this, Ursula, are clients taking their own photographs or are they being, bringing photographs of their choice or can you talk more about this? So you've kind of talked about it, but if there's anything you want to add to clarify, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I've discussed two, two approaches, um, which I think are available to coaches. Uh, the first approach is where this concept initiated from was I gave uh, participants disposable cameras. And I gave them a, a general prompt, which was to take photograph, to, to photograph or photo document their experiences with the Veterans Treatment Court. Mm -hmm. And I, in that circumstance, I left the prompt pretty vague because I wanted the, the participant to interpret that however they wanted to interpret it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had the photos printed, you know, at CVS at Walgreens. And then I we used each of the each of the images as a conversational tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's sort of the first approach. Many of us will adopt the second approach, which is to have clients take you know photographs on cell phones or digital cameras. Now, what photos do they take? That's going to depend on the context of um, what's happening in the coaching relationship, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I will add one other point uh, about this relates back to the my my star technique of making the familiar strange. Once you ask the client or the client agrees to photograph something they want to work on, once they start contemplating what they're going to photograph, that initiates making the familiar strange mm -hmm. because that in itself requires the person to to think about the issue differently. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there okay, the question. Yeah. No, that's good because if we take mm -hmm. it for granted, we're not focusing in on it until we're asked to. And that that's 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 great. And mm -hmm. you know, and I, I want to share the way that I use the photo technique um, with my college students. We went on what's called a civil rights pilgrimage. So this was an opportunity for them to dive into these difficult conversations around diversity, inclusion. Um, biases, belonging, and so forth. Um, and so what we did is we were in the Midwest, based in the Midwest, um, in Wisconsin, and we migra migrated, we traveled, I should say, we traveled <laughs> um, down to the South. Many of the students have never been to the South. Many of the students haven't experienced any of this. And so we visited some historical sites that were um, related to some of the social justice, you know, issues. Um, so we, we went to the, the, Lorraine Hotel where Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, we went to a couple of historically black colleges. We went to several other museums, landmarks and so forth. And we asked them to, it was a combination of video and photographs. So we asked them to video their experiences, do a video journal at the end of each day, um, photograph some of the things that they, you know, were compelling to them and, um, you know, uh, and, and we would have a conversation about it. And so what it did, um, especially the video journaling, was it gave them opportunity to reflect alone, um, verbally, um, in a safe space. 
And they knew that the videos weren't gonna be played for everybody. It was just available to me. And um, it, it really opened up some powerful dialogue around concepts that, that many of them weren't necessarily comfortable talking about in the beginning. The racial makeup of this group was 50% were white. The other 50% were students of color, which involved a mix of Asian, Native American, Black, and Latino. So the majority of the, the group was white and had never do dove into these conversations um, before. And the, the students of color, some of them did, but um, a lot of times when they did, it was amongst them, each other, it was amongst mm -hmm. themselves. Um, and so it was a, a really powerful way between the photographs and the video to, to stimulate conversation. So, yeah, wonderful. Um, so the next question is by Jordan Myers. Um, how do you encourage clients who are resistant to, cre oh, I think we already answered this. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got it covered, Jordan. All right. <laughs> so we'll go to David. Um, Desiree, how do you just define pedestrian movement? Yeah, so uh, pedestrian movement would be actions or gestures that people use in everyday life. So I would have them use whatever they believe was their way of doing a thing or their way of uh, gesturing to that. It's really similar to mine in some ways, in my opinion, but uh, not exactly like mine. But yep, actions and gestures that are a part of everyday, everyday life. Mm. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. So Robin is asking, saying, I'd like to hear how music, um, you know, could be integrated into a virtual session or a phone session. We're not in person. How do you integrate music and coaching virtually? Well, there are several ways. Uh, of course, um, we can listen together to a piece of music and perhaps different versions. Um, covers of the same song. And again, it doesn't need to be classical music. It should be the music that the client is uh, more comfortable with. And then just as you do an exercise uh, with photos, um, try to do uh, a little uh, exercise doing your, your presentation with what kind of background music. So that music brings in emotion. It's not about uh, putting background sounds, but about how can you enrich uh, the, because we're always afraid of using our emotions because we think we cannot control them. Mm -hmm. We cry or we may get very angry or we, and really before Prozac, uh, men invented, mankind invented, story for the labs, invented uh, music as a way to, uh, really uh, motivate us to work together, to row together. There's uh, this wonderful, by now, old book by Daniel Levitin, the, the, uh, uh, the World in Six Songs, and he talks about the role of music. He's uh, one of the earliest uh, music neuroscientists, uh, very much uh, his research is based in music perception uh, at uh, McGill University, uh, at how music plays a role in uh, in human evolution. Music allows us to see where the the animals in the wilderness that we cannot see. Uh, and again, if we look at the traditions of the earliest people in what is now Mexico, the Olmecs, I mean, they, uh, their priests and leaders were the ones that could howl like a jaguar because the jaguar represented the thunder on earth. The, the, the howl of the jaguar uh, announced people when to plant their milpa and when to collect the crops. And we can see that many of the of, of, uh, people in, 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 in pre-colonial uh, Mexico really uh, transform themselves into animals through dance and music. There's no word for music in Aztec or Maya or Olmec language, mm -hmm. but because music, dance and poetry are three parts of the same thing, just mm -hmm. like corn, uh, uh, pumpkins and uh, beans are part of the milpa. And this 
bring of the of the three cr uh, crops that make uh, life sustainable uh, are the same with uh, with creativity movement dance storytelling and and music and when we really put them together with a little bit of spice with a little bit of chile uh, <laughs> then we really have very powerful tools to uh, empower people to to really grow and self-realize and and achieve what they thought they wouldn't be able to achieve you know it's uh, I, I love that so much and i love the artistic descriptions that you integrate into this um mm -hmm. it, it just helps a lot um and i will say that from uh, the role of a professor one of the ways that i integrate music with the virtual platform is that i i use music videos um, and for one of the writing classes that I have, I try to encourage them to think about the difference in perspective and how their perspective really drives everything that they're about to say. So I play um, Michael Jackson's song um, around, uh, it's called, They Don't Really Care About Us. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about all the hardships in the world. And then I play Natasha Bedingfield's song, Feel the Rain on Your Skin. Mm -hmm. and very different perspectives in the world. And then we engage in a conversation around how would Michael Jackson approach writing a dissertation around racial injustices in schools? How would Natalie Bet Natasha Bedingfield write a dissertation around racial injustices in schools? And let's talk about how their perspectives are going to color the approach that they take to their writing. And so that's the way that I, that's one of the ways that I use music, um, you know, in, in my work. Yeah, um, I ask them to, I give them a playlist and I, I ask them to, uh, to take a break every hour and just have a five minute break and savor the music as you would savor your coffee or if uh, you enjoy wine as you savor uh, a, uh, the, the flavors of wine or as you savor the smell of the your favorite soap when you take a shower and so bring this is a mindfulness exercise yeah and it's stimulating those senses which is what creativity is so like that's one of the reasons why it's so important um okay we have three more questions um uh, to all of you, so you don't all have to answer, but any just given time, um, as you have listened to each other from this panel conversation today, what do you think you share in common related to your creative philosophies and approaches? I could say everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I admire the, the three of you enormously, and uh, I've, uh, I've been following Pamela's work for a long time, and uh, since we started this conversation, I've I've been looking at at about your work, and and I think that the 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 most common thing is that we are centered in 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 what it means to be human, mm -hmm. and the creator, and then the problems, the most complex problems of our time have to be analyzed with intersectionality, mm -hmm. and uh, creativity that as as you have said has been defined in different ways, but this, let's say the, the boilerplate definition is about generating ideas that are original or novel and that are useful or relevant. Mm -hmm. uh, what we seek in leaders in, in, in politics or in academia or in the arts are visionaries who can imagine a world we want to live in. Mm -hmm. And we can use intersectionality with all the arts to be creative and with all the musics. I mean, mm -hmm. when I teach, uh music i i celebrate as much salsa and music in the caribbean as i celebrate uh symphonic music or heavy metal that, that by the way has mexican roots also heavy metal <laughs> <laughs> i love it that's a whole webinar in and of itself yes, <laughs> all right <laughs> okay go ahead either ursula or both um and desiree i think benjamin said it perfectly i don't even know i don't have anything to add but okay. i think everything you said was great Awesome. Yeah, I, I'll add a couple quick things. One, I think we um, have all illustrated what beautiful things can come when we get uncomfortable <laughs> mm -hmm. and how much we can learn about ourselves. Our clients can learn about themselves when we step a little bit outside the box, a little bit outside of our comfort zone. Um, and certainly we are all demonstrating that uh, creativity. Um, again, use, I like my, the broad definition 
is is a sensory experience. Yes. It's yeah. not, we often think of creativity as a thought or a brilliant idea, but it's not. It's we feel it, we smell it, we touch it, we experience it throughout all throughout of our throughout our human experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A sensory experience. I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Um, so this question is for Desiree, um, Michelle is curious about the, the before and after movement exercise. Um, I understand this with a physical challenge, but how do you explain to explore it as it relates to emotional challenges? Are they invited to just express however it may feel? Um, yeah, I think, so I know I have someone that did have a very, um, like serious emotional challenge around whatever over over thing they overcame. Um, it wasn't something that was easy for her to kind of think through, but she wanted to bring it to the table. Uh, but again, I always start off with letting people know, hey, whatever is your comfort level. Um, and even though I gave them specific things to do, if they wanted to express them in other ways, um, they could. I gave them space to express it however uh, was most comfortable to them and where they are. So I think it's always important just kind of taking that temperature check with our clients and what it is that makes the most uh, sense for them. And I am, the, I, you know, as a coach, I'm not a therapist. I always am checking if there are some things that are like above me. <laughs> I'm like, you know what, you, this is something you might want to check out with someone else if this is too much for you right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and somebody asked that question, um, about trauma and I do not see it here. Okay. Uh, I don't know where it went. Um, but there was a question to the extent of um, when you are engaging in these emotions and this in, the, in this creative approach, there is always the potential to unearth traumas that people are mm-hmm. experiencing. Um, how do you all approach that when, when the potential for trauma does come to the surface? Mm-hmm. I, I have a list of people that I refer people to, um, but I also try to see like, hey, what do you need right now? Because I never want them to leave without whatever they need. They just need a moment. They need to be by themselves. They need to jump off the call. They need to finish talking. Mm-hmm. Whatever they need, I let them finish so that they can get what they need. And I always give, I have some back pocket resources uh, for them. And then I also reinstate what the purpose of the space that I have is Um, just so that they know like, hey, this is what this is for. I want you to know like you're safe here and that's what you needed to get off your shoulders today, but this is what this is for. And I always want to reconfirm like that's not my area of expertise. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a, you know, all of those things Mm -hmm. just so that they, I I just want to manage the expectations. I always do that at the end yeah, um, before they come back. Mm-hmm. So, and I will, I did find the question and it says, um, how would you suggest prefacing some of the use of photos, music, et cetera, during coaching, if there's a risk of triggering trauma, mm-hmm. um, understanding there is such beautiful healing in these elements, but there's also a risk of evoking powerful, unfavorable emotions and memories. So that's yeah. basically what they yeah. say. Go ahead, Benjamin. Oh. Yeah, I mean, um, um, this, something I do, and, and this is based on, on the Greeks, uh, is that we we think of uh, Greek theater as the great dramas of Aeschylus and Oedipus and but uh, people went to to the theater in in Greece because it was uh, an educational experience but they didn't go home after the tragedy they mm-hmm. had to have Sophocles at the end they had to have something to laugh they have to have something fun because otherwise you're carrying such a weight when you see someone uh, kill uh, his father and all the things that uh, Oedipus did and, and all these uh, Greek anti-heroes. So use humor. Humor is a great uh, way to cope in safety emotion. And I use humor on myself. I, 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 I try to use mirror exercises and, and uh, when I see that people are perhaps coming to, to a reproductive or I'm not qualified because I'm not a therapist, then I just try to bring in this Greek idea of before you go home, let's laugh together and let's dance and let's have some yeah. food and wine. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Thank you. Just, and do you have anything to add or something? Yeah, I'll just say um, a couple of things that I did. One, it, it's the any photographs that do not want to talk about. 
uh, before I even view them. So I, I that's one way of sort of um, safeguarding, um, giving clients a space to determine what it is that they feel comfortable sharing. Mm -hmm. I have certainly, when I was working with veterans, that uh, wasn't frequent, but I certainly had participants who, after taking photographs and looking at them, um, had some emotional difficulty and um, couldn't continue with the project. Okay. So that does happen for sure. And that's really, that's the challenge, I think, of, of asking people to step outside their comfort zone is that sometimes it can bring up uh, emotions that they didn't even know that were really there. So we yeah. have to be aware of that and plan for that. And now they're aware of it and they can always step back into it when they're mm -hmm. ready, but the sure. awareness has been created. I love that. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question and I want to give us a chance to just wrap up real quick. Desiree, this is probably just a yes or no answer, but it's from Abby and she's asking, do you ever incorporate movement by simply putting a song on that a client chooses and joining them in free form dancing as a way of either starting or ending a session for stress relief, for example? Absolutely. It is. It is. It is. Absolutely. And it's a lot of fun to do it that way. Sometimes if I know what they're dealing with, I might think of songs in advance and have them meditate on it prior to, and then we get into the space together. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. That's really good. That's really good. Okay. Well, gosh, this has been such a good conversation. I think Time flies. I know, I know. <laughs> so I'll give you each 30 seconds to close with something like profound, no pre no pressure, but <laughs> or how people can best contact you in the work that you do. So we'll start with Ursula. Hi, sure. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I really enjoyed enjoyed it and learned so much from each of you and also from the audience questions. Yeah. Um, I would uh, direct people who are interested in coaching with photographs to a blog I wrote for IOC, and that offers more techniques on how to use photographs. Um, another technique that I haven't talked about is giving photos titles, which is also um, really impactful. So uh, you can, I'm on LinkedIn, so feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, and my email is there as well. I'm also a professor at Ohio University. Thank you. Thank you. And Sue, if you can, um, in the follow-up email, if you can in include Ursula's blog, that would be really helpful or in the chat um, to everybody. Absolutely. Um, okay, Desiree, thank you. Yes, it's been such a pleasure. This has been such a fun conversation. Uh, very enjoyable, very enlightening and all of that. Um, best way to find me is on LinkedIn. Um, I'm Desiree Pocroft, MBA on LinkedIn, and I have a blog on LinkedIn as well, Success Hacks for Life. Um, and if you want to see my TED Talk, <laughs> you can uh, look at my LinkedIn profile. I have a link for my TED Talk, uh, Finding Your Way Through Leadership or Dancing awesome. Your Way Through Better Leadership. Thank my TED you. Talk. And Benjamin. Well, um, I, I want to recommend coaches not to be afraid mm. of uh, exploring their creativity and not to be afraid of exploring music or dance mm. or the arts in general. And uh, uh, as I have seen, um, talent is universal. Opportunity is not. Mm. Mm. And the role of the educator and the role of the coach is to create more opportunities for people to be what they want to be, to achieve what they want to achieve. And again, I'm also available on LinkedIn. And if you look me up on uh, uh, iTunes or YouTube or mm. uh, Spotify, you can listen to some of my recordings as a conductor. <laughs> I love it. This is amazing. This. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for your time today. Um, there will be, the video will be made available to those of you who've registered. Um, so definitely watch again and stay in contact and have an amazing rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs>